Okay. Uh, okay. Welcome everyone to the International Philosophy Talk series held by Department of Philosophy at Marmara University here in Istanbul. This is the 24th event in this series. Today we are glad to announce you our presenter, Dr. Davide Battisti. Today's talk is entitled Procreative Responsibility and Assisted Reproductive Te Technology. First, I would like to introduce him to you briefly, and then talk will last about 45-50 minutes, and we are going to have a discussion and Q&A session afterward. Davide Battisti is a postdoctoral researcher in philosophy of law and bioethics at the Department of Law and the University. <laughs> He also serves as an adjunct professor of bioethics in politics, philosophy, and public affairs program at the University of Milan and Vita Salute San Rafael University. He has published several papers on topics such as reproductive ethics, the allocation of scarce healthcare resources, the ethics of science communication, and research ethics. And his work has appeared in journals such as Bioethics, the Journal of Medical Ethics, Social Epistemology, and Ethics of Human Research. Very nice to see you today, Mr. Battisti, and thank you again for joining us and participating in our Philosophy Talk series. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Davide Battisti. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a huge pleasure being here with you uh, and I thank uh, Marmara University for allowing me to talk with, uh, with you this afternoon. Um, today I'm going to give a talk about cognitive responsibility and assisted reproductive technology that is one of the main, the, my main topic uh, in particular because I'm going to present the main thesis uh, in my upcoming book for Routledge uh, uh, property response title, property responsibility, and assisted reproductive technology. So, uh, the very, very briefly, I'd like to give you some uh, information about the summary of this of this talk. Uh, first, I will just set the background and the framework in which I am going to I am going to discuss. In particular, I will uh, present. Uh, what I call the greater moral obligation view in the context of assisted reproductive technologies, in particular in the development, the continuous development of assisted reproductive technology. Then I will set a little bit about the theoretical framework that I want to assume in this kind of discussion. Of course, reproductive ethics could have, uh, be addressed from different kind of perspective. I will focus on a specific one, but however, I think that could be shared uh, in a very broader way uh, among persons giving or having different kind of moral perspective. Then I'm going to discuss uh, a distinction that I propose, namely a distinction between the notion of procreation and the notion of reproduction, because I think that in light of this kind of this, uh, it's kind of this, uh, uh, distinction, we are able to provide a more suitable differentiation, uh, distinction between our property responsibilities. Then I will provide two arguments in favor of the greater moral obligation view, the consequence-based personal affecting argument, and the non-consequence-based personal affecting argument. Despite that, they have different kind of implication. In my perspective, they support this kind of view that I'm going to discuss. So uh, all this kind of discussion is, okay, perfect. So all this kind of discussion referred to a trend that we are going to, to have in the last decades, the fact that in light of the possibility of assisted reproduction, our, um, our possibility to influence human reproduction is increasing. Here in this, in this talk, I'm referring mainly to four technologies, two currently available and two that may be available in the future. So the first one is in vitro fertilization, the possibility of uh, uh, adding an in vitro embryos through artificial fertilization, uh, following by so a union bumping, a uh, sperm on one end and egg 
together, so adding embryos and then transferring in utero. This technology alone could be useful to avoid a fertility problem, for instance, but if we combine this with another technology that is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis of the more, or in a more recent nomenclature, pre-implantation genetic testing, testing uh, could be useful, this technology, in order to select embryos according to some characteristics. Uh, for instance, this kind of technology, PGD, could be used, uh, useful in order to select an embryo that cannot have any pathological trait, but not only, we could have, uh, we, we could use this kind of technology in order to uh, maybe select the sex for the child, not for avoiding its linked disease, but for no medical reason, because the parents want to have a, a female or a male or because this is something like uh, more rare, but still interesting for our perspective, for a philosophical perspective, the possibility to select not only to avoid disability or genetic disease, but to search, but to seek for disability. Uh, for instance, uh, achondroplasia and deafness. There are some uh, fertility clinics in the US that allow to uh, access this kind of technology in order to seek and select for some uh, disability trait or for uh, generally conceived disability traits. Of course, in the future, maybe with PGD for polygenic traits or screening for polygenic traits, we may be able not only to select for non-pathologic, sorry, not, uh, for pathological disease, but also for non-pathological disease such as Carter and uh, um, I don't know, uh, and so on and so forth. Moreover, we have we would like to focus more on two uh, future, maybe uh, future technology that may be available, uh, maybe in next in coming years. When I'm referring to reproductive genome editing, actually this kind of possibility is already something like a reality. If you consider what happened in 2018 in China, where the uh, Chinese scientists uh, he and Q declare to have modified the genome of two twins, two embryos developed in two twins in order to make this kind of genome more resistant to HIV using the technology uh, called the crispr cas It is a very uh, precise technology allowing to modify genome of organisms and as a consequence also human organisms. So, of course, this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, usage of the genome editing has been uh, uh, contested by scientific community, but it's not so um, strange to say that maybe in five or 10 years, we'll have the first clinical application in the context of uh, in vitro, uh, in vitro embryos. So the fact that using in vitro fertilization combined to modification of genome in order to avoid some trace, or maybe in the future, maybe in, even to enhance maybe some characteristic outside or beyond what we consider uh, generally health. Right. Uh, I don't want to discuss about enhancement. There are a lot of uh, uh, debates in this. Uh, I already mentioned this kind of debate in a chapter in my book. However, I want to discuss about the application of uh, uh, genome editing in order to avoid some uh, harm or some uh, defective characteristic in the future chart. And then maybe in a more speculative perspective, we can also discuss about ectogenesis. Maybe the possibility also the uh, of the possibility of developing the fetus and the embryo completely outside the female organism. Ectogenesis can be both the partial, if we consider that uh, uh, fetus can be um, developed outside the womb, the womb of the mother after the 22nd week, or maybe allowed to develop in a very earlier moment, so after eight, nine days, even uh, outside, maybe beyond 14 days. This is a partial ectogenesis. So at the end of the pregnancy and the very beginning of the one, uh, but maybe the most uh, maybe speculative and interesting also from a philosophical point of view, the complete ectogenesis, the total ectogenesis. So, from the beginning to the end, having the possibility to have pregnancy outside a female organism. Well, these are the technologies that we are going to discuss today. So thanks to such technologies, uh, reproducers' capacity to govern production and its outcome has greatly increased 
in the recent decades, think about the infertility uh, problems that now can be overcome by uh, in vitro fertilization of the fact that I can have a child without some characteristic, considering the fact of PGD. And so I think that could enhance, we can say that this kind of technology enhance procreative autonomy. However, these techniques also show that necessity of rethink procreative responsibility. Here, we are attending something like uh, a tension between procreative responsibility on the one hand and Prerogative autonomy on the others. Due to the continuous development of uh, uh, reproductive assisted reproductive technology and the increase of our genetic and scientific knowledge, many procreative facts no longer occur in the realm of nature, but fall within the field of what we can control. So, in light of this, several philosophers argue that. In light of this kind of new control, maybe we can face even more. Uh, or greater obligation. And this is what I call, from my perspective, the greater moral obligation. So the fact that due to the continuous development of the, uh, assisted reproductive technology, we will face a greater moral obligation, in particular considering genome editing and ectogenesis. So indeed, given the peculiarities of, of some artificial uh, reproductive technology that could have a future clinical application, Prospective parents will face greater moral obligation than moral constraints encountered in a context where only current arts are available. Arts is for, stand for assisted reproductive technologies. So, and this will inaugurate a substantial expansion of property responsibility, an unprecedented change since the introduction of arts decades ago. And this is the uh, cover, just uh, a spot moment, so sorry. So, of course, this kind of view is not new. Many authors provided some reasons in favor of an expansion or greater moral obligation. And there is no need, according to some authors, to wait genome editing or ectogenesis to face this kind of greater moral obligation. But already in the context of genetic selection, namely the context of PGD plus IVF, so for implantation genetic diagnosis plus, um, we, we face this kind of obligation. Think about uh, Henry's perspective, or maybe the most famous one, the Sabulescu and Kahan in 29, or, uh, 2009, of course, in the first and previously proposed in the early uh, 2000. Uh, by some list that is the principle of procreative beneficence, the obligation that parents should have in order to, ref to employ IVF plus PGP in order to select the best possible child, not only from a pathological perspective, so avoiding some traits, but also to search for some character traits that is not pathological at all. Okay, but we have also reproductive altruism, property altruism provided by Douglas and the Holder, and even property justice provided recently by, uh, by Marvel. And these kind of principles, or what we can call models of property responsibility, can have different theoretical framework. My framework is a very specific one, so uh, now I need to explicit in more details, what is my theoretical starting point? There is what I call person affecting morality, what um, uh, um, Derek Parfit called person affecting morality. Namely, an action or omission is wrong, morally wrong, only if it affects or it's at least directed toward a specific individual, namely an actual person, a person that surely will exist. Okay? Of course, this kind of assumption is huge controversial. Think about these cases. Eddie and Anna want to have a child, but they discovered that Anna has rubella. Their doctor informs them that if they were to conceive now, their child would be born deaf and blind. If they choose to wait three months, they would conceive a healthy child. However, the couple decided to conceive a few days later, giving birth to a child with the aforementioned condition. Of course, there is a very strong intuition that Eddie and Anna should have wanted to, should have had to wait in order to avoid this kind of condition in the 
future child, right? This is a very strong intuition that we have. However, my assumption, the person affecting morality provides no reasons for arguing that Eddie and Anna did something morally wrong because the parent decision cannot harm the resulting child. If the parents had waited, a different child would have been born, a different union between a specific sperm and a specific her, a specific oocyte would bond together. So maybe call this kind of death line the child, uh, I don't know, Harry, if the, the couple would wait, maybe uh, not Harry, but uh, Rose would have been born. Okay, so a completely different child. And from this perspective, the, co the, the notion of harm, as we will see, is conceived in the counterfactual comparative harm. The fact that I need to have at least a comparison between two possible worlds, two possible scenarios in which a person still exists in both of them. In, which, in this perspective, deaf child, the deaf uh, blind child would have the one possible future that is a future or an existence with deafness and blindness. And this is what a uh, very uh, implausible conclusion that, uh, coming from the non-identity problem. The non-identity problem is basically the conflict between our intuition that Eddie and Anna did something very morally wrong, but on the other end, because they harm the child, but on the other end, we cannot uh, isolate, identify any kind of harm if we consider that what is morally wrong is only what harms someone and what is morally what is what is uh, what uh, benefits someone. Okay. However, however, regardless of this kind of controversial, my uh, my intention, my purpose is say that personal affect morality maybe it could be considered not enough to having something like a broader perspective about how our more uh, our more moral, our sorry morality however the person affecting uh, reason the relevance of person affecting reason is is something that is rarely denied so person affecting reason can be uh, considered or can be considered relevant from different perspective okay and on the other hand, if people that consider only uh, person affecting reason use this kind of morality in order to say that maybe in PGV context, in the selective context, when we are about selective, we have to allow for whatever we want. And so it's something like a tool in order to support my. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Battisti, your voice is uh, now weak and I think disordered. Can you check? Mine? Yes, please. Can you voice? Can you hear uh, me? Can okay. I? Yeah, I can hear you. Now, now, now we can hear, yes. We okay, so sorry, so sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I was saying, I don't worry, I was saying that uh, I wish that even stemming from this minimal theoretical background in light of the future availability of uh, genome editing and the ectogenesis, we are still committed to supporting the existence of greater moral obligation for prospective parents. My arguments uh, are twofold. So in the first part of my talk, I will discuss what I call the consequence-based person affecting morality argument. That is, uh, assuming just the fact that an action or a mission is morally wrong only if it harms someone and morally good only if it benefits someone. Here, as I said earlier, we have a counterfactual notion of our person P can be said to have been harmed by the occurrence of X when the absence of X would have been resulted in a state of affairs in which P would have been better off. Of course, we have a comparison between possible worlds in which P exists. 
I have provided an argument in favor of this extension of property responsibility stemming from this particular person affecting morality. And then in the second part of my talk, I will say, well, intention and attitudes for many people as well play a very substantial role in morality, in assessing the rightness and the goodness or what wrongness of our action. So I will provide an argument stemming from a non-consequence-based person affecting morality. From this perspective, an action or omission is morally wrong if it is informed by defective attitudes and intention toward an actual person, and good if it is informed by good intent, attitudes and intention toward someone. In this perspective, I cannot have an intention toward, for, for instance, providing or producing, uh, creating a aggregate, uh, sorry, a world with a more aggregate well-being. My intention should be directed toward a specific person, okay? However, this kind of argumentation can be embraced in uh, uh, separately, so I will discuss in I will discuss them separately. Okay, is it clear? Perfect. So, but first, in order before presenting this kind of arguments, then with this kind of uh, person affecting morality, I will answer the following question: On which property obligation do I focus? The authors who supported the existence of new property obligation in light of assisted reproduction, I so disagree about to whom these obligations are directed. People say, well, we need to produce the aggregate, more aggregate will be, regardless of the fact that I am or not person. Or people say, well, I need to focus only on the resulting child, but other to say, well, you have to take into account other existing person, okay? So it is essential to clarify that there can be at least in formal terms or different types of procreative responsibility that here I understood as a raw responsibility, the set of obligation that someone who uh, is about to reproduce could face. So here I propose a reflection limited to a specific type of procreative responsibility. This, I take advantage to this question in order to make a distinction, as I said, between reproduction, property responsibility, and reproductive responsibility, okay? That I think that could be quite useful to introduce this kind of discussion in the debate. So I will say, procreative responsibility is the general responsibility encompasses all moral obligation related to procreation. Then we have procreative parental responsibility. That is, the moral duties that a procreator have toward the resulting child. However, according to some, reproduction could affect also third parties. So this, we have another kind of responsibility that extends beyond the parental child, the parent-child bond, to broader ethical consideration. And here I identified at least three kinds of reproductive responsibility. We may have parental, uh, parental reproductive responsibility, duties toward existing child, or family-based repro reproductive responsibility, duties toward the family unit, or broad reproductive responsibility, duties toward society or the world. Reproductive responsibility can be oriented in two different ways. A qualitative-oriented reproductive responsibility involves genetic traits and characteristics of the child, so specific uh, traits that could be uh, could be advantages or could be uh, useful for uh, satisfying the reproductive responsibility, okay? So here the focus is which kind of trait, so maybe disability or not disability or enhanced intelligence or not enhanced intelligence, okay? And then we have quantitative oriented reproductive responsibility. There is decision about the number of the child. Think about the one child policy in China and all the models proposing some limitation of the number of child that a production uh, procreator could have. However, here I focus on property parental responsibility. So the obligation that we have as a procreator, not toward the world, not toward the parties, but toward a specific child, the resulting child. 
Okay? This is the focus that follows in my two argumentation. Okay, so first, consequence-based person affecting argument. Remember the person affect the consequence based the consequence based person affecting morality. Now we can address or we can understand which kind of obligation we have in the selective context. So when just current available technologies is available, so IVF and PGD, and then we understand what are the um, implications in the context of reproductive genome. So in the context or in the selective context, we should limit to embracing less demanding models, such as the minimal, what has been called the minimal threshold models in procreative responsibility. According to this model, every reproductive choice in a consistent way of the case of the Anna, to say that we already encountered, is legitimate except bringing children into the world when there are good reasons to think that their quality of life will fall below an acceptable threshold. Lives below such a threshold are often termed life not worth living, relatively rare case where extreme suffering completely outweighs any expected positive experience. Only in this context, we can say that existence is something like an harm in itself. In all other consideration, in, other, in all other situations where the life is worth living, then we cannot have any more reason to say that procreators should uh, take a decision rather than another. So this model, of course, is something like compatible with the selection that I mentioned in the first slide, that is selection for disability. So think about selection for having a deaf child or selection for a chondroplasia and so on and so forth. As Rebecca Bennett, one of the supporters of this model points out, as long as we are choosing to create worldwide lives, whether we choose a fetus who will be deaf, hearing, highly dyslexic, short, tall, highly intelligent, and so on, is not a moral choice, but a legitimate preference. This is a very important in our perspective. From a consequence-based person affecting here, we have just a preference to select a child without any trait or with this kind of trait, okay? Nobody has been harmed by the parent's decision because of the reason I mentioned in the context of, uh, of Eddie and Anna, deaf and blind child, because there is no possible future for that specific child to be without or with some genetic traits. Deafness, for instance, for uh, a genetic selection for deafness and the resulting child that is deafness, deafness is the a necessary condition for the existence of that specific child. Is it okay? So, but the context could be changed if we consider the future availability of reproductive genomedity. So, although at the first glance we can notice that similarities between reproductive genomedity and PGD could emerge, indeed, both practice can be used in in vitro fertilization. Uh, process in order to have a child with some specific traits, PGD and reproductive genome editing may, however, be considered different from a moral standpoint. In the context of PGD, we are merely selecting an embryos for genetic characteristics that they already possess. It is something like a necessity for, uh, something like a necessary condition, this kind of technology, this uh, kind of of trade. However, in the latter, so for genome editing, we are modifying a specific embryo to change its genome. So here we have a different kind of possible future, a different kind of version of the genome of the resulting child. So, okay, in order to provide some reason, in order to the fact that we can have some moral difference between the two practices. Think about this kind of case, this kind of comparison. On the one hand, we have Julia, that is a newborn who is affected by disease X, which saw not so bad as to make her life not worth living, uh, to slightly to significant harm her. 
a cure while it's available, effective, safe, legal, and cheap. On the other hand, we have JEV2B, that is an in vitro embryo that is about to be implanted or transferred in his mother uterus in order to develop in a person called JEV. JEV2B is affected by a genetic mutation causing a genetic disease X1, which is likely to significantly harm him in the same way as X affected Julia. As in Julia's case, JEV2B with X1 is expected to have a life worth living. A genome editing treatment Y1 is, uh, that solves the genetic mutation is available, effective, safe, legal, and cheap. So in both cases, parental decisions are dealing with the same person, the same what has been called numerical identity, identical people. So numerical identity is the relation between uh, a thing as only with itself, okay? So here we are dealing with specific person. Parents' decision not to treat them can significantly harm both the existing child, in Julia's case, and the future child, Jack to be case. Julia and Jeff could be made worse off by the parents' decision to avoid treating them, and this is a strong reason in favor of a moral duty to treat, which is independent of Julia's current suffering. Accordingly, in both cases, a specific individual has a right to complain about their parents' decision. So, thanks to this kind of moral analogy between a scenario and familiar scenario, that is the scenario about genome editing, and a familiar one, that is the scenario in which we have to treat a newborn, we have some moral reason to say that there is some comparison. And so the moral reason that we have to treat Julia apply in the context of in vitro fertilization with genome editing. So we have the same moral reason to treat Jeff to be before transferring him into the uterus. Both treatments Y and Y1 are indeed available, effective, cheap, legal, and safe. So Julia and Jeff state of health are under the control of their parents. Therefore, the moral reason that, he, that in Julia case imply an obligation to treat her are also found in Jeff to be case. Both set of parents face a similar moral obligation to treat their child. So, of course, now we have to specify when we are going to face this kind of greater moral obligation, because what is the greater moral obligation? Whereas in the context of selective genetic, when there is just the availability of the genetic selection with PGD, we don't have any moral obligation to produce a child without uh, Y1, so, sorry, X1, when there is the possibility to treat, and we have the possibility to do that via uh, reproductive genome editing, we face a greater moral obligation. The variability of reproductive gen uh, genome editing generates moral obligation every time that reproducers are about to transfer a specific human embryo that will develop into a person suffering from genetic disease that meet the following criteria. First, they are such diseases that are compatible with a life worth living but harm the child. B, they are diseases for which, at the moment of IVF, safe treatment with RGE is available and legal, and it's not possible to treat them effectively in vivo or after the birth of the child. So here I propose a feedback from a consequence-based person affecting perspective, a property response, parental property, uh, sorry, property, parental property uh, responsibility model that is called mild restriction of prerogative autonomy. According to the mild restriction of prerogative autonomy, reproducers have a prima facie moral duty to transfer into the uterus an embryo without genetic disease that meet criteria A and B, only if they are already in the IVF process. That is, when in vitro embryo already exists, and if they want to have a child from one to those created embryos. Only in such cases, it's sensible to speak of a person affecting harm and benefit. The existing embryo, which is designated to be transferred, could be indeed modified to avoid genetic disease and disability. 
So more specifically, parents will encounter a moral obligation, a greater moral obligation, A, not to modify the designated embryo in order to have a child with a genetic disease or any condition that potentially harm the future child, B, to use the genome editing if the designated embryo has a harmful genetic disease that is curable via uh, reproductive genome editing treatment. C, moreover, in the more distant future, parents to be should screen their embryos for a potentially harmful condition treatable with RGE. Extension, so we have an extension of the use of genetic testing in embryos in the IVF process. Of course, here there is a technical caveat that is provided technical feasibility to screen with PGD before the, uh, the, the possibility to modify the genome. Before going on with the second argument in favor of the greater moral obligation view, we should notice, you notice one thing. The fact that it is not this kind of model, the mild restriction of procreative autonomy model or principle, does not undermine the right to reproduce via sexual intercourse. Because the fact that I decide to have a child without employing IVF plus PGD, so with assisted reproduction, change the identity of the embryo. Okay? Since the fact that the child that I, assuming the fact that assuming the fact that I decide to reproduce uh, through sexual intercourse, and then after nine months, a child with disease that was curable in the in vitro context is born. This kind of child cannot be, uh, cannot complain with the parents. Why? Because he or she cannot be found in a situation in which he or she can be treated. Because the decision of the parent to employ in vitro fertilization could change the time of the reproduction. And so a different sperm and a different egg would bond together. So this is the reason why this kind of obligation emerge only for parents that already are in the IVF process, so in the in vitro fertilization process. This is very important because things maybe could change if we consider the intention and the attitudes from a personal perspective. So now, after this clarification, we can pass to the second argument. Sorry, we have to mention some potential objection, but just to, to mention it, maybe we can discuss in the Q&A and then we can pass to the, to the second argument. Of course, this is the, 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 there is a very great assumption here. The greater moral obligation of you rests on the assumption that genome editing is what I call non-identity affecting practice. That is something that cannot change the identity of the child. Okay, namely procedures that will affect a person who will surely exist with the same identity, with the same numerical identity. However, this kind of assumption is far from clear. Think about the fact that a genetic modification can change the numerical identity. So the embryo A modified can result in embryo B. Hmm? And this is what I call the identity objection that could have different kinds of formulation depending on the metaphysical definition of identity we can embrace. Think about the identity as the, the continuation of genetic material, or think about the uh, think about the identity as a continuity of psychological sorry uh, the uh, of psychological continuity or think about the fact that the biological account so the continuity of the same organism being alive of course there are other critiques something like the critique of necessity of genome editing for the existence of the future individual so the fact that uh, the future individual is created only to be treated. And then we have other kinds of uh, critiques and maybe we can discuss it if you already encounter in your readings. It is the typical constraint future objection or the necessity of genetic selection uh, provided by Sparrow in American Journal Bioethics uh, articles quite recently. 
Despite that I don't have time to discuss them, I address in chapter five of, of my book. So we can uh, shift to uh, a situation in which we say, well, maybe there are some people People that say, well, morality only uh, considers consequence, but other people can say, well, intentions and attitude could have some relevance. This is because the consequentialist or consequence based personal effect morality has negative side at the end, uh, and Anna case is one of them. For instance, in the selective context, it's required us to give up some of our moral intuition, as in the case of selecting for a reservation D. So several authors maintain that attitudes and intention are crucial aspect of morality, and considering them may be a useful strategy to deal with property decision. This may overcome some of the counterintuitive implication of the consequence-based personal effect in morality. And different perspective has been proposed in the debate. Um, Think about the parental virtue approach proposed by McDougall or the principle of deliberate impossibility provided by Novel, the collective interest argument, and so on and so forth. Notice here, I don't want to claim that intention and attitudes do play a role, but just assuming that intention and attitudes play a role in your moral uh, framework, then we have to assess if uh, intention and attitudes could play a role in the property context, okay? I think, yes, I think that intention and attitudes could play a role in property context, for in particular, if we consider what I call the parent-child relationship argument. When we procreate, we intend not only to create a child, but we are going to create a new relationship. The relationship plays the parent, both the parents and the offspring, in a form of mutual vulnerability. This relationship must therefore be considered relevant in itself from a moral point of view. Creating a relationship binds us to the role of parents and therefore to a certain attitudes and intention toward our child. Of course, there is an open question if these uh, duties also include, sorry, these intuitions also include procreative obligations. So if the parent-child relationship could uh, allow us to say that we have not only parental, uh, a duty to have some parental intention or obligation, so acting informed by the intention to protect the child, but also in the context, in the realm of procreation. In order to uh, provide an affirmative answer to this perspective, we should notice that considering the relational aspect of procreation, we can appreciate, observe two types of attitudes that can be distinguished in the property events. So the first one, we have an attitudes or an intention to create a child. But however, we have another, another um, desire or another attitude that is the wanting to parent a child, wanting to be parents. So a couple who through PGD deliberately select a child with disability D wish not only to create a child with D, but also that any embryo, whatever the identity, any embryo chosen, develop, still continue to develop into an individual with it. So we have to formulate two different desires. The first is creating a child with D, and the second, we should say that this kind of embryo should develop in a child with D. Although we, um, I think that we can say, uh, selecting a child, selecting an embryo with D, is something like that we usually uh, say in the debate, this is not properly correct because there is some uh, likelihood if we consider also, for instance, non uh, perfectly penetrative uh, disease that the child could develop in a different way than uh, the, the genetic, the genetic uh, trait could say. So 
In that situation, the, the parent have been, has been committed or is committed to say that he or she wants that the child develop in a certain way. Okay, so there are two desires. The first one, of course, is, is non-person affecting because having or not this kind of desire affects the identity in the same way having or not a child with uh, uh, in vitro fertilization. You remember the case that we discussed at the end of the uh, last, the, 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 the previous argument, the fact that if I decide to have a child with a web or with a specific trait and I decide to employ a web, for instance, I change the identity of the child because I change the time of, of uh, um, the time and so the, the, the sperm, the, the probability of the sperm and the whole side that bound together. However, the second desire is referred to whatever identity, the resulting embryo, whatever they be, the resulting embryo, I want that embryo, the specific embryo, developed in a condition that is according to my desire. So a condition for instance, D. And the second desire or the second wish is addressed to a specific individual, even if at the moment of the parental decision is not yet known which identity they will have. This desire or attitude is a kind of person affecting attitude. So this kind of desire is compatible with the person affecting morality. So what are the, con the implications in the selective context? Provocative with sadistic and selfish attitude, which intentionally uses IVF and PGD to select an embryo with certain characteristics that favor the purpose of domination and control over the future child could be considered morally problematic. But this was not the case in the context on which only consequence-based personal affecting perspective was embraced. In that perspective, whatever, if they are provided if the child is with a life worth living, there is no problem about procreating with this kind of sadistic and selfish attitudes. In the context in which intention could play a role in light of the parent-child relationship argument, we can say that this kind of procreate decision could be considered morally wrong. Future parents with disability D who are looking for a child similar to them, but at the same time, they recognize D a condition that there is causing suffering or reducing opportunities are also morally problematic. Again, as a, uh, in a, in, on the contrary, then in the consequence-based person affecting morality uh, discussed earlier. On the other hand, there would be no reason to criticize the future parents for leaving the decision of which child they would have to choose from chance to random because because in that situation, I'm not committed to say that I want that a specific child will develop in a situation, in a defective condition. But I just say hope that will not, will not happen. So there is, no, there is no possibility to criticize these kind of parents that led to chance the, um, the possibility of having or not a child with D. Moreover, it would be also legitimate to see a child with D, so a disability, but conceive a, this, this kind of disability, a trait that does not cause disability or suffering. This is the case in case about, uh, think about uh, the deafness is not considered a disability for the deaf community, but just a diversity trait. And it's not a disability at all in this perspective. So from this perspective, there is, uh, no possibility to prescribe to this kind of couple that procreate with this kind of intention to say that they are doing something morally wrong, okay? But what is important here is understanding how things could be changed in the context in which we have a future availability of reproductive genetics. So intention here, the fact that I would like to intend to have a child without um, uh, without, uh, without, for instance, uh, a disease because I want to protect the child. Here, it seems to reinforce the, pres the prescription of consequence-based person affecting morality. Here we have discussed the post-conception context, the context in which the consequence-based person affecting morality apply. But here is not so interesting because we already have other kind of reason to say that 
we are not allowed to select a child with some disease that could be uh, avoidable with genome editing. What is important here is the context, the preconception of the con context, where the consequence-based uh, person affecting morality cannot any words, cannot say anything, as we said, because if we decide to modify, to employ a web, we basically were changing the identity of the embryo. But here, things is different because in the preconception context, the second wish of the parents could be that the created embryo developed in the best possible place to avoid suffering. So even if the first desire is, of course, creating a child with genome editing or not creating a child with genome editing, so can change the identity of the embryo, uh, the second desire, the fact that Whatever the embryo, I would like to enlarge my, uh, or having more room to protect the child, whatever maybe they, or whatever kids have maybe some disease that could be curable via uh, genome editing. Genome editing did increase the possibility of parental control over the characteristic of specific future individual. Basically allow to have more room to have responsibility for the child. So more room to show protection to, toward the child itself. So through genome editing, parents would have more room to express attitude of care and protection toward the future individual. So the parent child relationship is not only compromised, not compromised, but uh, the use of genome editing, but even promoted and enhanced by the couple that decide to reproduce uh, reproduce via genome editing. This argument could be even more, uh, can even be more compelling if we consider also the future possibility of ectogenesis. It is not directly, of course, a person affecting technique or a non-identity affecting technique, a technique that cannot change the identity of the child. But it allows you to uh, use personal affecting techniques, such as somatic genome editing or fetal therapy. So not only genome editing in the context of embryos, but also during the pregnancy in a safer way than uh, invasive treatment that we already are uh, available. So ectogenesis would therefore be an ideal place to let your future child develop. The choice to undergo this technique could therefore promote the quality of the parent-child relationship because the future child will be aware that you created them in the situation in which we, you wanted to ensure the more room as possible to protect them to avoid future disease. This child could even be grateful indeed in the light of the results, although she could not be said to have been basically now we benefit from the specific choice because of course a different child would have been born. But the quality of the child relationship, the child, the parent-child relationship is announced. This is the point here about the relevance of intuition and attitudes. So here we have to shift. If we consider intention and attitudes as morally relevant and we embrace the parent-child relationship argument, we have to shift from the mind uh, restriction of property autonomy to the bold restriction of property autonomy. The obligation is not only toward the parents, the prospective parents, already within the in vitro fertilization process, where the embryo already exists, so the identity is fixed. But this kind of obligation is faced by all parents who are, who are about to reproduce. Indeed, from this perspective, we should introduce a new principle, the border restriction of property autonomy. All potential parents, so not only the parents within the IPF process, in the economic and technological condition, to do so should encounter moral reasons to reproduce through the following practice. IPF, in order to employ uh, reproductive genome editing to the designated embryo whenever the latter is affected by treatable genetic disease that harm the future individual, and ectogenesis in order to employ treatment, treatments, genetics, or otherwise, if the embryo's fetus is affected by condition 
potentially harmful for the future in the people. So intention and attitudes can play a moral role in the procreative context if the parent-child relationship argument is embraced. It solves some counterintuitive implication in the selective context, but it's not the most interesting thing for my talk. What is most important for me is the fact that it justified that we have more a reason, not only preference, we could have preference in the context of consequence-based personal affective morality to have a child uh, to, with this kind of, of this uh, uh, characteristic changeable with uh, genome editing. So some preference to uh, employ an assisted reproductive technology. Here, we no longer have just preference, but more a reason, because in this way, we are enhancing our parent-child relationship. So it justifies more reason to resort to personal affecting techniques. So here we are uh, facing further extension of property responsibility compared to duties already justified by the consequence-based personal affecting morality. So conclusion, I provided strong arguments in support of the greater moral obligation view. This will significantly extend the boundaries of procreative parental responsibility and consequently, in broader terms, procreative responsibility. These theses appear to be broadly supported across various moral perspectives, which acknowledge that moral relevance of consequence-based personal affecting and or intention and attitudes in a way compatible with person affecting morality. So I and that thank you so much. And sorry if I was not be clear, I'm able and I'm here for having uh, some clarification uh, answer. So no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for this rich, enlightening, comprehensive presentation touching on various issues concerning bioethics. It's been great to uh, listen to this and get a fresh perspective on this topic indeed. Uh, so I guess the floor is now <clears throat> open for questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm just looking here if there are any questions. Uh, I see you all. My mm. Docha. Yeah, may I have? <laughs> of course. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Davide, for your great presentation. Uh, we have already exchanged our thoughts on your excellent paper, you know, earlier, once they, once the date after they published. So thank you uh, for your efforts in bioethics, actually. It's really inspiring. Uh, but your argument um, revolves mostly around health or physical well-being. Uh, because I think a life worth living, you know, you just defined it um, uh, in the, at the beginning of your presentation, cannot be just defined only in terms of health or material or financial uh, well-being, but also of social environment, you know, the family needs, family dynamics, etc. So one may claim that um, uh, from your, you know, um, argument. One may also claim that we should restrict those applications like reproductive technologies uh, due to our obligation to the future children uh, because uh, they have a right to have stable, safe and, and nourishing family environment too. Not only the health related issues like you mentioned the genetics and you know chromosomal diseases, uh, but also uh, to make them sure they have socially stable, connected, you know, um, safe and, and nourishing family environment. Can we, uh, so so what I'm asking actually, can we use your argument also to restrict the parental autonomy in a way that uh, to ensure the um, social well-being and uh, of the child as well? Because physical and, you know, health uh, and or physical well-being matters, of course, but it is not the only thing that makes a life worth living. So I, I have so, uh, uh, some other questions as well, but I really wonder your thoughts about this question first. Oh, may, thank you. It's something like a crucial aspect is, of course, I focus more on what I can uh, affect during, uh, you know, 
assisted reproductive process. However, in particular, I think my last argument, the one uh, non-consequence-based personal affecting morality argument, I think that there is some reason in your direction. So there is some reason to wait in a certain way to ensure that you have the stability to uh, grow up the child in a social context. So I think that I, I didn't want to extend my argument in the book and in my in my papers because you know uh, it's something like more restrictive. But I think that, and I, I hope that someone could do that, uh, could apply this kind of argumentation in the social context. So I, I do agree with you that there is some uh, relevance here. There. And thank you for noticing that. Yeah, uh, and you know, just uh, let's uh, just imagine like um, gamete donation, sperm donation, or ova donation. So in that case, in, especially if it is anonymous, so the the child, the future child, is not going to know who is his father or his mother. So from your argument, you know, when when I was listening to you, I just apply, I just change the health issues with those kind of social issues, like not knowing your parents and, you know, or being a, the child of a solo parent and those stuff. So we, I think uh, your argument may help to, you know, extend the discussion uh, also for the social well-being, not just like the, you know, or the the social aspects of a life that is worth living. So I I, I feel that's crucial and thanks. Uh, thanks no, for th thank you thank you thank you for noticing there and yeah, it could be could be great to to extend this 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 work and other kind of reproductive decisions because I just focus on the assisted reproductive decision. So decision regarding uh, the development of uh, I don't know genome editing and ectogenesis so but yeah, yeah. I think I do I do agree with you. I definitely do agree with you. I have something like that uh, in, in, in pipeline and writing about what I consider from a consequence-based person affecting what I consider reprotiming arm. So the fact that uh, if, for instance, uh, parents already have IVF process, we have um, embryos. And so uh, think about the fact that uh, a, a war exploded uh, think about uh, a, a war beginning in Ukraine, for instance. And so maybe there are some reasons to wait to transfer the embryo in utero in order to, uh, so, to cryoconserve the embryos mm -hmm. and then wait for, uh, for the, the transferring in order to have a safer uh, and effective and social and safer uh, context. So I think it's something like it tend to, to go in your in your lines perspective. So yeah, I definitely agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, yes related answer, Dr. Battisti. Uh, Maido Jam, can you have uh, another? But I have one more question, but I yes. don't want to you know dominate the the field. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I will take my turn. <laughs> okay, let's go on uh, with your question, Sinamo Jam. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Battisti. Uh, for your talk. Um, I have an issue with Eddie and Anna, as you can um, imagine. Um, the two people who are going, who are not waiting the, for three months. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Eddie, yeah, okay, Eddie, yeah, okay. So let me, let me go back with the slide. Um, uh, and my issue has to do with the identity um, that you yeah. mentioned. Um, because it's not, uh, uh, the born child is not identical, uh, therefore, uh, the person, uh, what was it, person affecting morality, um, yeah, the... does not apply. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so, um, I understand that, uh, if they don't wait and, um, then of course the child that is born is not going to be the same child as the one that if they wait and is born. Uh, therefore, um, the uh, the one that is born as deaf, they don't have the, the person affecting um, morality. However, uh, doesn't that then translate into the question of uh, I mean, the child wouldn't have even existed uh, 
uh, not just in terms of being identical, but the child wouldn't have existed. Um, and I mean, they, let's say they didn't wait and they have the child, mm -hmm. they decide to wait, then that child that would have been born deaf would not have, of course, existed and therefore would yeah. not have been deaf either. Yeah. Um, but then the question kind of turns into a question of, you know, which one is better to exist or not to exist, which is a much different question. And it seems to take the uh, topic to another uh, platform, which seems irrelevant uh, to these issues. But um, yeah, that, that's, my, that's my problem, yeah. Yeah, if, no, no, no. I, I th thank you, thank you so much for your question because it is relevant. The fact that the comparison between existence and non-existence is very relevant, in particular if we consider um, the minimal threshold model, so the fact that we are allowed to reproduce in whatever way we want, provided that we provide a life worth living. Some could say that, for instance. Uh, uh, because you cannot compare existence and non-existence, it's something like morally permissible, even, um, even procreating a life that is not worth living. So some authors um, try to reject the minimal threshold model because of this kind of non-comparability of uh, existence and non-existence. Uh, so I think that there are different ways to reject this, the fact that there are, for instance, some, uh, Melinda Roberts uh, believes that there is some comparability between existence and non-existence. When we, for instance, there are some uh, uh, people uh, when with a very serious disease that ask to, to, to have, I don't know, assist in dying, is because they say that it's something like my existence is worse than nothing. So at least some minimal uh, comparison, we can do that. Of course, you can reply and say, well, in that situation, an individual still exists. But in the context of uh, uh, in procreation, of course, we cannot have this kind of individuality. Mm -hmm. From this perspective, someone could say that uh, uh, still, when a person exists, uh, still could have some uh, life that is worse than nothing. So there is some reason not to create the context in which a, a person uh, experience a life that is something like uh, worse, worse than nothing. It's a very complex, uh, com it's a very complex topic. But of course, of course, uh, I, I try to address a little bit. I tend to say that uh, there is at least two ways to say that uh, we can say that a life is worth living. The first one is saying that there is some comparability is possible. There is the perspective provided by Melinda Roberts in a uh, 20, 2009 article. And the other one is saying that um, there is some absolute uh, way or no comparative harm there. The fact that uh, despite the fact that we cannot compare existence and non-existence, still the existence could be better or worse than nothing. When I prefer something uh, when I prefer nothing rather than my existence, it's enough to say that a life is worth living or is not worth living. And why say that I prefer this existence rather than nothing is enough to say that a life is worth living. I don't know if I'm mixing myself clear. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, uh, as you said, uh, quite complex, but... Um... Definitely. Your suggestion with the assistant suicide, uh, perhaps if some kind of analogy could be formed, maybe that would benefit. But your position is that, as far as I understand, that there is a platform on which these can be compared, right? Yeah, yeah. there are two. Uh, I, I, don't take, I, don't take a, I don't take a position here. I just say that there are two strategies that huh. should be reasonable. The first one is saying that there is a comparability this is the, the fact that uh, non-existence and the life will be zero. And so 
when you exist without a life worth living, your well-being is negative. And when you exist with a life worth living, it is positive. But non-existing something like it's zero, uh, it's zero point. It's the position of Melinda Robert. And the other one is the position provided by Parkit and McMahon. They say that, of course, we cannot compare existence and non-existence in a strict way. However, we can still say that existence with a life uh, uh, a decent life is worth than nothing. And uh, having a life uh, with a lot of suffering is something like that is life uh, that is worse than nothing. So there is no need to say that there is something like comparab uh, comparability. However, we can have still some worse than nothing and better than nothing comparability. Is it it's okay? There are two yeah, reasons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. At, at, at least there are another, there are uh, third ways I can say, that is, I think that were more elegant in my opinion. Uh, this debate, the comparability between existent and uh, non-existent, consider existent like turning light, something like in a very immediate way. However, before experiencing suffering, pain and pleasure, we have mm, at least some months without this kind of, uh, of capacity when we are embryos there. So in that situation, we exist as individuals. I'm not saying that we exist as a person, but in, as an individual, we exist, we do ex exist. And so there is reason to say that this kind of situation is better to uh, experiencing some very, very bad uh, suffering and so on and so forth. So even if we cannot compare existence and non-existence, then we can say that the first months in which we have uh, uh, no experiences is better than a situation we, we experience very worse pain and so on and so forth. So here we can comparison between two different stages in existence and then we can, uh, you know, uh, having this kind of discussion still. This is, uh, uh, the, this position is provided by De Grazia, David De Grazia. And I, I, I tend to, to say that I like it. But uh, mm -hmm. in, in the book, I just present this kind of three strategies mm -hmm. uh, without taking any positive stance on one of them. OK, thank you. Thank you. Don't worry. Much. Thank you, too. Oh. It's a very yeah. relevant topic. I think Mungehoja has a question. This is your turn, Mungehoja. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, so my question has two parts um, about the modification of embryos. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that this introduces kind of like an engineering point of view, an engineering attitude or an instrumentalist attitude. And this may be considered problematic uh, on two fronts. First of all, this may be considered problematic from the point of view of um, our notion of a person. Uh, so treating uh, a person like the Kantian maxim, treating a person as a means and not uh, not as a means, but an end in itself. Uh, particularly if we consider, for instance, enhancing the uh, genetic makeup of the individual, giving them uh, even some powers, for instance, engineering a child with uh, increased capabilities and treating a child kind of like an artifact uh, whose uh, instrumental capacities can be enhanced. So this, this may be uh, problematic, first of all, from the point of view of our notion of a person and the inherent value of a person, regardless of their in, uh, instrumental characteristics. Secondly, this may be problematic from the point of view of the parent-child relationship. So uh, the parent-child relationship is supposed to be um, characterized by unconditional love. So I can imagine some parents like uh, trying to come up with uh, kind of like a super intelligent child. And this, this doesn't really sound ethical to me. And a side question, um, does your framework consider, does your framework make a difference between modification and extreme modification? Somebody also could, uh, create, for instance, a hybrid, a hybrid uh, species, overcoming uh, the human uh, limitations, for instance, and hybridizing a uh, human embryo with uh, some animal characteristics, 
to enhance vision, enhance athletic capabilities, enhance lifespan, whatever. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think that my point is committed with this kind of engineering attitudes because I'm not considering enhancement. This kind of arguments has been provided in literature, for instance, uh, by Michael Sandel uh, and so on and so forth, in particular, in line or in the context of the possibility of enhanced child. And I think that in the context, maybe uh, the parent-child relationship could have some uh, discussion worthy to be done. I, don't, I didn't take uh, a stance here with regard to the implication of the parent-child relationship argument in light or in the context of genetic enhancement. So in light of providing uh, some um, more intelligence, memory, or providing a greater lifespan. There are some controversy there. Uh, there are some, for instance, uh, Sandel or, uh, or other, uh, Prusak, I think, that they wrote an, a, a book in 2013 regarding property responsibility and said that parent-child relationship could say, could, uh, you know, could say, well, there, there is some problem parent child relationship if we enhance the child. However, someone could say that parent child relationship in the context of enhancement is, sorry for the treaty games, enhanced in the context of I provide some uh, more benefit, provide more, I don't know, more intelligence, but I don't want to take this task. I just uh, confine my perspective in a negative way that is the way in which I try to avoid harm. So if, the point is, if we have some moral intuition that in the case of Julia, so a newborn, we have some moral duty to treat, and not because we want to uh, treat her as a male mean, but just because we want to promote her uh, benefit, uh, well-being, or uh, enlarge their autonomy, and so opportunities, we are committed to say that the same uh, obligation, and I can say, following the second of my argument, the same intuition of protection and promoting the well-being of my child, we can have. So I don't think that we can have some uh, commitment with engineering attitudes because my uh, topics has been limited to a negative stance of avoiding harms. And here we cannot say that in genetic engineering is per se, something that could promote some uh, hubris or, uh, you know, engineering attitudes toward humanity and so on. We can use them just to avoid some genetic treats in order to promote and uh, well-being and protect the duty to care, sorry, the intuition, uh, sorry, the intentions and attitudes of caring and protecting the child. So I don't think so. Uh, but thank you for yeah, thank you for this. I, I discussed a little bit enhancement in my in my book and the chapter six, but only with uh, the lens through the lens of the child's right to an open future. And for instance, according to Prusak, this kind of argument is not enough because we need to have a discussion, of course, in light of the parent-child relationship argument. But in chapter seven, when I discuss parent-child argument, I just say, well, it's an open debate where uh, if the parent-child relationship argument ban some kind of uh, genetic enhancement or even provide some reason to promote some genetic enhancement. I don't have a, a view on this, uh, and maybe it could be very interesting in the future uh, months to, to reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Isakuja, we are listening to you. Your okay, question. thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this presentation. Even asking questions requires some technical information, complicated information. Unfortunately, I have, I'm not expert on this issue, but yet I have a question. And uh, my question is uh, uh, just opposite side of Miguel Hoja's question. Uh, let's assume that it is accepted according to experts or some, uh, probably a government, that much healthier babies are born through the use of advanced artificial reproduction techniques, including genome editing and many other techniques. If it is the case, how can we morally interpret couples 
who insist on having children through natural sexual intercourse. In other words, how can we be evaluate morally uh, these kind of uh, couples uh, to have a random childbirth whose health status or other characteristics, characteristics are unknown or probably risky? And is it possible, finally, is it possible to limit or prohibit natural childbirth if it is the case? Thank you. Thank you for just for this challenging question. So, um, so this is quite complex to answer that, but uh, because there are two levels. So, if we consider that there are a lot of healthier child, you can say that there is some social pressure in order to. So there is some social norms, not so much a moral norms to uh, push procreators to have some kind of child rather than another. With regard to moral uh, level, I think that in light of the availability of genome editing, we can have more reason to employ genome editing because in that way, the second result implied the second attitude implied by this kind of decision enlarge our uh, enhance our parent child relationship, uh, the quality of it, because protect and take care of the child in, uh, basically in uh, more room, more space than natural, uh, natural intercourse. My perspective, however, is not to provide some absolute moral duties. I don't say that there is this kind of moral duty is quite strong because, because, moral, because human reproduction is quite complex. It's quite complex. There are a lot of aspects morally relevant to consider. Think about the fact that the, uh, women and men, but in particular women, uh, experience social pressure in order to reproduce in some time of their life, for instance. Or think about the fact that um, the couple could uh, stress or could struggle in knowing a lot of information about the child. So human reproduction, in particular in the context of assisted reproductive technology, is complex. So uh, I don't want to provide uh, absolute moral duties to refrain or sorry to employ this kind of technology. However, I just provide some moral reasons. To do that, that should be balanced to other kind of moral considerations as well. But thank you, quite quite interesting question. Because yes. my, it, it's not an absolute, but prima facie, so a conditional duty is not an all things considered duty. Just to be clear. Thank you very much for your answer. Again, uh, can we hear your question, Alisaito John? Yeah, thank you, thank you for this very tight presentation. For me, it is a strange, a strange subject. So forgive me for, for my ignorance if I ask a very simple question. Very, it is a very simple question. Uh, at the same time, maybe general, very general question. Uh, when you use the term of morality in the text, in your presentation, and after the discussion, even, even you explained uh, in, in which uh, perspective you use that, this term, I'm confused, really, so I don't understand very well in which sense, in which definition you use the term, the morality. Because if we look a little bit uh, at the story of the philosophy, you know uh, the term of morality is used in the, uh, in the perspective of the law and the rules. So when you use the term of morality, you refer to some uh, rules, maybe predefined or discussed after. So, so if you if you argue that anything goes or anything could be uh, in different perspective in different case, so you don't have actually the 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 term of morality. You you can use another term uh, instead of the morality. You can say just in the perspective of this uh, this case uh, according to. I don't know the, the avoid, avoiding the harms or avoiding the, avoiding the suffers. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? So, so I, 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 I wonder 
what is for you the moral thing? Actually? Okay, okay, okay. Thank, thank you so much. I, 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 I know that defining morality or defining ethics or defining both them are, are quite complex. Um, the the Anglo-Saxon uh, standard can try to distinguish more as being or used to distinguish morality and ethics. Morality is a set of principles embraced by uh, or rules, beliefs uh, uh, embraced uh, in a society. So we can look from a descriptive descriptive point of view the values of a society in a given time. And ethics is something like the the rational justification of some of these principles. Okay, uh, so I, I just use this kind in some in some word, but. Uh, of course, then some could say that morality, uh, for instance, Bernard Gap say that morality could be, uh, say, with different kind of levels. So a descriptive level, that is the form that I refer, and the second level, that is the, something like a normative one, so the second that I refer. Uh, basically here, more without any, uh, you know, being uh, committed to this kind of discussion, it is a complex and very fascinating to say, uh, because maybe there are another kind of distinction, you know, the Hegel one, the Hegelian distinction between morality and uh, and uh, and ethics, or the Bernard Williams one. So there are different kinds of, of, of definition of morality. Here, I wanted to say when I refer to morality, what is morally relevant? Okay, when I discussed, uh, wait, when I discussed personal affective Morality, I said that all, what is morally relevant in our moral calculation or moral evaluation is only action or omission wrong, uh, that affects or at least is directed toward a specific individual. So that's the point. So what is morally relevant for me? Because, for instance, if we consider direct party perspective and say, well, uh, there is other consideration that we consider. The fact that we should create, regardless of the persons affected by this kind of our decision or omission, or sorry, action or omission, we should create a world with greater, with a greater amount of well-being. Okay, this is something like an impersonal view of morality in my in my in, in my in my talk in my in my in my context. But here, when I discuss morality, maybe. You uh, maybe I agree, maybe I, I could change the name, but I refer it only to what is morally uh, worthy to be considered. I, I think that uh, I, I hope to, to be clear. Okay, okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Bye, right, um, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Batisti. Uh, Ardo Ojam, I see, I see you have a question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, uh, for your presentation, Professor Battisti. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm really uh, not familiar to this uh, terminology, uh, but I'm interested in flow of ethics, of course. Uh, that's why I wait, you know, the member of audience, uh, you know, uh, finish their specific question <laughs> concerning this point. My question is about your uh, conception of technology. Uh, as far as I uh, under understood, if I correctly un understood actually, uh, you use the uh, technology as an instrument to achieving to achieve a specific purpose. For instance, in this case. Uh, you use, you say, uh, you uh, you hold. We uh, we can use the productive technology uh, to have child, for instance, in the uh, in the uh, in the first case, uh, Eddie and Anna, for instance, or we can multiply the other uh, uh, cases. So as you know, uh, contrary to this perspective, there are different philosophers who defend the uh, autonomy of technology. Well, for instance, in this case, you adapted the uh, reproductive technology to your case 
and the result is okay. It means, you know, uh, at the end of this process, nobody is harmed. And, you know, you have uh, a, a, a child uh, in a good situation, in, well, with good healthy uh, situation. But the philosopher, for instance, uh, Bruno Latour, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Heidegger and many other philosophers, they hold that uh, actually technology uh, has its own ethical perspective, ethical standards. Uh, so when we use any technology, Actually, we cannot totally control uh, this oh. technology. The technology works like an agent. Uh, so that's why we can say there is a reverse adoption. Maybe in this case, well, yes, by using the reproductive technology, we have child uh, and uh, maybe, you know, as you said, this doesn't undermine the classical method to have children, for instance, you know, via uh, inter uh, sexual intercourse, etc. But in the process for this philosopher, actually, this technology that we use requires some ethical, necessary ethical, you know, uh, framework, ne necessary ethical condition in which maybe in the process we can lose, you know, natural, uh, natural having, you know, children. And maybe in the process, uh, you know, only we can use this technology to, to have children. So what is your position, especially uh, these uh, counter argument, especially concerning your uh, conception of technology? Well, thank you so much for this interesting situation. I have first to admit that I'm not, um, or I'm not, so, I'm not uh, the, uh, your, the... your voice your voice is problematic can you check now okay. Okay. No. please again oh, there's a background I'll repeat it background um, busy noises oh, now it's totally no, no, we is cannot it... hear totally gone is yeah it okay now yeah, yeah, clear. Yes, clear. But I, I, I cannot. Sorry. Yeah, it's super now. Okay, is it okay now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We, we can hear. Okay, perfect, perfect. I, I change. I have some problem with my speaker, headphone speaker. So, yeah. uh, if I cannot hear you, I can. I let you know. But now you can hear me better. Uh, by the way, so I was saying that I, I, I thank for for the for the question. I, I'm not so an expert in the philosophy of technology provided by Heidegger, but also in Italy Severino and uh, and other philosopher that saying that you know there is some autonomous movement of technology in a certain way. Um, so I'm not maybe the right person now to to answer to answer the question. Because of the fact that maybe I would I would benefit more, uh, I would be I would benefit to read more on on this. Uh, what I can say is the fact that uh, I I cannot I tend to first assuming the fact that natural intercourse could have some more relevance. I'm not denying this. I'm not denying this because this could be balanced between the moral reason that I proposed. Okay, so uh, this kind, my view is nothing like 
denying this kind of, I, I don't think that genome editing could deny, at least from a moral point of view, maybe from a social point of view, could be. The fact that maybe there are some, uh, some implication from a social point of view, but from a moral point of view, uh, my perspective just provides some reason to be balanced with the moral maybe relevance, putative moral relevance of moral of the sexual, natural sexual intercourse. Second, uh, maybe I could doubt the fact that the natural intercourse could have some moral relevance. The fact that nature could be considered often as something good it's something like I think it's, it's something like a mistake that could be detected uh, in the human meal literature, in the um, in the context. The fact that say, well, we need also to define what is nature. First, if we define nature, what is something like that is um, outside our our the law of nature? Well, there is no need to say that natural intercourse is something like different from the technical or artificial intercourse, because both of this kind of reproduction fall within the law of nature. Second, we can say that nature is something like opposed to humankind. So in this way, yes, natural intercourse is different from the technical one or the, the assisted intercourse. But in this way, if we consider the fact that the natural one is good and the other is bad, we can say that uh, other kind of our action that is against nature, even curing disease or, or uh, digging or other stuff could be considered morally problematic. So I tend to be skeptical when, say, when people say that there is some value, intrinsic value in nature and in nature intercourse, because First, uh, saying that nature is good is something like a, a logical jump. Second, we struggle to, de to define nature in the way I suggested. But thank you for this question, because this pushed me to read more Heidegger and Latour and other, and other readers. Thank you, writers, thank you. Thank you. Yes, if there is no uh, one for the first tour, let me ask one of my questions. Uh, my question is similar to the question of my dojas. Uh, you have made a clear debate about procreative freedom versus procreative responsibility. Uh, here is what I'm curious about. I wonder uh, your opinion about lineage, uh, progeny, I think. Lineage, lineage, progeny the bound between the uh, offsprings. The lineage is currently determined by genetic bond now, but after the practices such as surrogate motherhood, or in the future, you mentioned ectogenesis, something like artificial bombs, the concepts of, for example, genetic motherhood, surrogate motherhood and nurturing motherhood become different and they have diverged. In this new situation, what will determine lineage according to your perspective of responsibility in special name, um, greater moral obligation will? And lineage is, uh, we know, uh, all we know, important because responsibility and law, even religious laws based on it generally, which type of uh, motherhood, for example, will be given priority, superiority, and how will procreative responsibility be shared among the, uh, in this case, for, uh, in this case, three, uh, for example. Yes. Well, that's a very, very complex question. I, uh, in my view, I just assume that re single reproducers or couple that intend to have a child will have some responsibility because they want the child. So I did not evaluate or investigate the possibility or of having maybe three parents uh, that want to take responsibility or the implication of ectogenesis or, ectogenesis or I don't know, um, uh, stepchild adoption, oh, sorry, um, 
of uterus donation, uh, sorry, uh, womb donation, and so on and so forth. Uh, yes, could be interesting to investigate it, uh, but I think that provided that we have a couple or a single reproductor intending to take responsibility, because here we have a situation in which, of course, an isolated situation that could be uh, different as you suggested, but here uh, we assume the fact that we have two cup, two, two reproducers or one that want to take or want to have a child. The fact that he recognizes the future, the, the, the kind of embryo that he is about to implant or transfer as the future child establish a continuity, a moral continuity between the embryo and the future child. And so uh, parents as recognizing that embryo as the future child and large, uh, sorry, imply some moral obligation. Uh, I'm quite, um, I, I don't want to take a stance how this kind of obligation can be divided by different kind of parents. I leave open this possibility and for sure it could be very interesting to having some uh, reflection in the future on this. Thank you. Yeah, one uh, small question about this issue. Uh, in innovative treatments involving collaborative reproduction with third parties such as, such as egg sperm donors or surrogate mothers, yeah, yeah. can the consequences of sexuality, can the consequences of uh, reproductive acts be divorced from individual responsibilities? Uh, what does it mean to deprive a child of a genetic link, genetic mm -hmm. linkage with those who raised him or her in the first place? For example, does the child also have a right to have a genetic link with its parents, his parents, her parents? What does it mean for a child uh, if his or her birth is organized in such a way to deprive him or her of the universal experience of having a genetic parents? Oh, wow. This is a, this, oh, no, this, is a, this is a very, very interesting question. The fact that so if the child has some right to have some link with their parents, um, I don't. I, I. I. cannot. I'm not an expert on this, so I cannot provide uh, a, a, a proper I answer. I perspective Whether, answer. Yeah, uh, I think that. Well, I have to think about it. Uh, I tend to say no in the fact that um, there are some. I don't think that there is some harm in not having this kind of link if we consider some. Uh, evidence uh, from uh, research papers and stuff like that and survey. Uh, there is no harm in not having uh, this kind of link. So, uh, and so the fact that we have some um, comparable situation in uh, people with the same link uh, with the people with the child with a link with the, the, the parents and the child without this kind of link. So in light of this, in light of the fact that there is no harm there, I don't think that there is some link in having a parent uh, genetically related to, to the child. Uh, but this is a non-expert uh, uh, perspective. So I just leave open for future reflection on this. And thank you for this uh, interesting and intriguing uh, question because yeah, this pushed me to think about more about the implication of this kind of perspective in a uh, broader way, not only about just the obligation toward the child. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great answer. Sina Mujam, I see you have a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, this is more of a clarification uh, question. Uh, I want to make sure I understand something correctly because if I, well, let me <laughs> ask the question. When you talked about Julia and versus Jeff to be, when you made that analogy, um, I, if I understand correctly, your purpose was to say um, whatever we think should be done to Julia, the born one, um, should also be done to the Jeff to be, therefore, whatever interference is required, it's morally permissible, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's the case, um, the analogy, however, 
would not work. The, the analogy doesn't seem to be symmetrical, though, because one then might say, um, for instance, if the um, Jeff to be, if is if you determine Jeff to be have to have some uh, genetic disorder, uh, and if that is you know figured out or found out about at the right time, uh, per, uh, abortion might be morally permissible. Whereas, <laughs> of course, if Julia has the same thing, it's not permissible to kill it. Yeah, so yeah. when you take that analogy. Yeah, it's uh, it might uh, yeah. take it. Uh... This is a very good point. I I definitely address this uh, this uh, this topic in both the paper in twenty twenty one paper and in uh, in the book. I did not address it because of time, because of lack of time. But this allowed me to discuss it. Of course, uh, there is some differences because of course there is you know to. Uh, the Julia parents face two options, cure or not cure. Whereas the uh, Jeff to be parents face three options, cure, not cure, not to transfer. Okay, I'm not claiming that uh, my view uh, reason against abortion. My perspective is compatible. I'm not, I'm not providing reason favor or not abortion, but my perspective is compatible with abortion because the obligation is not toward Jeff to be, but the obligation is toward Jeff. As I said earlier, in light of the fact that we recognize Jeff to be as the future, as our future child, only after that we face moral obligation to treat it. However, we can, uh, you know, give up with this kind of recognition act and then say you know maybe having some abortion or stuff like that i'm not one to take this kind of position however my view is compatible with uh, uh, with the view that abortion is permissible because the obligation is not toward the embryo because i in, in my book i assume that the embryo cannot have any moral uh, status however my perspective is compatible or can be embraced also from a perspective in which embryo is uh, a person. But in my perspective, person is not, sorry, embryo is not a person. However, the obligation that we have is toward the future child, not uh, the embryos in itself. So there is some room for abortion as well. There is no problem about abortion. Thank you for noticing that. Thank you. Thank you. Miguel Jam, could you share your question, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So I, I I don't want to tire Dr. Batisti. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm just I with my head on my head, uh, my head, um, my hand on my head because I have some problem with my head, uh, with my speakers. So I struggling in hearing you, but I. I try to do that, but without no problem. I'm quite happy that you um, ask me a lot of questions because allow me to have more, more, more information to to process and more things to think about. Thank you. So go on, please. Yeah. So uh, if you allow me, I just want to give you a very real example that uh, that might be uh, like a. a food for thought uh, in terms of tying actually Erdal Hoca's point to uh, my original point about the enhancement. So I just want to give this example and I'm not actually expecting a response from you now, but it is a relevant uh, problem, I think. So currently in Turkey, by the way, these are my daughters. Yeah, <laughs> I should but... introduce them because otherwise... Uh, I need to acknowledge otherwise they won't. Okay, so currently in Turkey we have this problem in the uh, medical system. So a lot of the technologies that were originally invented to cure disease 
now are being used for uh, predominantly for enhancement. And this is becoming a problem, actually. So, for instance, the um, general surgeons want to become obesity correction surgeons only. And people who need uh, like general surgery for disease have difficulty finding such good surgeons because the demand is on the side of uh, these uh, operations where they uh, stitch up the stomach, etc. Mm -hmm. Or people can't find proper uh, reconstructivist uh, plastic surgeons uh, mm -hmm. because a majority of plastic surgeons uh, are involved with aesthetic improvement. Yeah, you are famous also for hair transplant. There are a lot of Italians going to Turkey in order to have a hair transplant. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I have some doctor friends and they are telling me uh, very complicated operations uh, they are not performed in uh, many hospitals anymore, not as, as much as mm -hmm. before. Okay. A lot of the, you know, knows, uh, yeah. I, I don't know the English word for it, but they are also performing surgeries uh, to uh, improve the shape of the nose. The, the plastic okay. rhinoplastic, I think. Yeah, yeah, rhino. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, and they, they, they uh, it's, it becomes difficult to find. So, I mean, in this way, I think this is a good example of the technology becoming somewhat autonomous because all of these techniques were originally invented to treat disease mm -hmm. or uh, some sort of correct, uh, they were corrective procedures. Uh, but now the demand, I mean, also this is an outcome of demand. The demand is so high that uh, the technology our, I mean, people's general inclination is towards solving these problems and uh, legitimate um, health issues are uh, left behind. Okay. So I, I thought this is a relevant example, just food for thought. And uh, I, I think this is a great example in order to understand the enhancement or the tendency we have. I, th I don't think it's the technology itself a problem is the value that we attach to the technology that is basically our you know um, the, 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 our attitudes to be selfish and and so on and so forth that is maybe some problem in some circumstances not the technology itself of course some technology could allow in a greater way to satisfy some uh, bad or putative bad or good traits of our personality. Um, yeah, I think it could be I mean, a very interesting case uh, in the context of, I don't know, maybe allocation of healthcare resources when a state or a country provide uh, a putative right to healthcare. For instance, in Italy could be and is a problem, uh, not so much because uh, aesthetic uh, treatment, but for, for others reason, providing some um, some treatment for people that need it because of the fact that allocation, uh, sorry, the, 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 the resources are scarce. Uh, but I, I don't have an, a, a strong position on that, I have to say. I think it's quite a different topic, but still relevant in order to understand uh, maybe about the, 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 the first, the previous questions about the autonomy of technology and if technology could have some you know uh, direction that is not uh, there is no possible to control because it's rendered more is i think it's rendered easier to satisfy our bad traits i don't know but i, I don't have a position on this i mean my, my, my point is once the genie is out of the bottle uh, yeah, you are providing a slippery slope really, argument here. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You can't differentiate between enhancement and treating a disease, you know, because it's the same. It's the same technique, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and this is very difficult to trace a distinction between therapy and, and enhancement, I have to say. So uh, maybe this is a very interesting case. In, in there are a lot of cases in US of uh, diagnosis of the. ADHD, so a syndrome of attention, right? And so a lot of parents go to the physicians with the child and say, well, my, my child is affected by ADHD. Um, and so 
And this is uh, Colin Erig uh, wrote an article uh, in 2018 and said that there is two reasons why. The first one is the fact that there is something like a distinction, uh, there is a blurred distinction between enhancement and therapy. And the second one is because, uh, and this is quite linear or in line with the Sandel perspective that you mentioned in the, in the uh, earlier question, the fact that parents want the child go to the best, uh, practice the best sport uh, and be at the first place in whatever activity they do and blah, blah. And so this is a very, uh, you know, dominant tendency or hubris tendency. Of course, this is an interesting topic, but um, on the other hand, saying that we cannot use this kind of technology or general editing in order to avoid treatment uh, because of this risk could be considered the future people that could benefit on this, something like a mere mean to the, um, to the purposes of our society in order to avoid some, uh, some kind of uh, bad consequence. So here, your Kantian perspective is something like upside down in the sense that where we are uh, treating the people that we cannot, uh, we cannot modify, so they are suffering because they could have been avoided modification, but we cannot do that because maybe there is a possibility of enhancement. But here we have, the, you know, uh, treating them like like mere me. So there is a Kantian argument against that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maido Jam. <laughs> do you have any any other uh -huh. questions? You don't have. Okay. Not anymore. Thank you so much. It's now crystal clear. <laughs> With yeah. all the beautiful questions. All the questions for all of us. I think it's over. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time <laughs> to discuss and take other questions and remarks. Uh, I'm thinking about so many things, so I don't want to end, to be honest, but we are almost out of time, actually. Thank you again, Dr. Battisti, for the talk, and thank you all for your insightful questions and comments as well. Thank you again for participating in our Philosophy Talk series again. See you 25th Philosophy Talk series. And you can follow our announcements from our Twitter account and hope to see you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a huge pleasure uh, having this kind of presentation. And if you have more questions, please write me on david.battisti uh at uh, unibg.it so but we can i'm that. available to further reflection uh, all the time so thank you so much for this opportunity it was really really fun and philosophy is fun sometimes and this is one of the time thank you thank you okay thank bye, -bye. You. thank you thank you bye